Okay, welcome everybody to today's talk. How exciting today we have Faustino Cortez with us. Uh, Faustino uh, knows a great deal about pyramids and I first came to meet him in a presentation that he gave on zeolites. Um, and I'm so very thrilled, Faustino, that you would make time to share this presentation. It's the first time that you've given this presentation in English. So thank you for being here with us. Thanks for giving us your time. Thank you very much, Angela. And uh, I, I'm feeling happy to sharing you this information. I've been investigating, uh, searching almost seven years of following up uh, Janik's work. And well, I, I got interested on the, phys the physics of the, of the food because I don't know, here in, here in Tampico, I've heard a lot of uh, myths or stories about giant vegetables being grown uh, near this tower, which is called the Bernal Tower. And there's a, there's a guy, I will show you some pictures, maybe you have seen them, which is Don Jose, which came here to Tamaulipas to do some experiments using uh, some type of seed activation, which uh, later we knew about, he used uh, some information about cycles of lunar cycles and sun cycles, uh, which I uh, found interesting. But the interesting part is that he grew them very near this burnout tower. And I know this uh, tower is made out of basalt, which is a paramagnetic uh, a mineral we all already know about. And well, there are ma many stories uh, surrounding this tower, which uh, it's, it's information about even sorcerers and wizards and witches doing magic and strange stuff. You know, here in Mexico, <laughs> there's a lot of witchery stuff and I don't know. And there's also information about uh, UFOs uh, being seen in this area. Uh, hovering over the top, for example, and different uh, formations of the cloud formations are weird sometimes during the year. And well, uh, what I understand is that there is a very strange electromagnetic uh, thing happening over there and around Tampico because uh, strange things like uh, UFOs are, are being seen all around Tampico since the year, the, the 1950s. So there's a, there's a history behind this information, uh, which, which is interesting, but has brought me over here trying to understand how these electromagnetic fields uh, work in, in the area. And well, I started using zeolite, which is also paramagnetic type uh, mineral, which is uh, from a volcano. And I pro professionally uh, been studying zeolites and applicated in different uh, in different places like the National Institute of Investigation of Forestal and Agriculture, which had used our zeolite like four to five years and have gotten result, amazing results, not only on the growth of the, of the plants, not only on the health of the plants, but even in the soil, the bacteria, and well, it's just volcanic uh, ash which has been formatted in this uh, crystal called the zeolite. And, uh, and well, we have uh, studies done here and we uh, uh, patrocin uh, gave zeolite for free to this uh, institute to use uh, the zeolite in many projects. And uh, well, I am also a member of the World Health Coalition, which we use the zeolite for detoxing people. For, from uh, different type of issues. I'm also a member of INSA, which is the International Natural Zeolite Association. I've been recognized by them by, uh, by being a good exposer on the zeolite uh, uh, theme. I'm also part of the uh, Andreas Ludwig Kalker Foundation, which is the CLO2 uh, teacher. He's a bio German biophysicist, which has used uh, the CLO2 for many reasons, uh, health issues and also agriculture. And I'll also be uh, being, uh, doing some presentations in the University of Bolivia, Oruro, which I have it here. Uh, zeolite is recognized here in Mexico by the Mexican government and Zagarpa, which is uh, the FDA, for example, of agriculture. And we use the zeolite as an alternative, ecologic, and very economic for agricultural. Uh, purposes. 
And well, uh, it's recognized as a very healthy and secure mineral, which can be used as a food supplements or even for agriculture. Uh, this is one of the studies made on jalapeno and habanero chilies. And uh, the best results were got when we used one ton, one tonelada, one ton, which is, is it that way? Okay. One ton of zeolite over one hectare. We got the most uh, production, the most uh, gain of, on kilograms. Even uh, we had the most uh, money income, for example, for, 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 the, for the place that we use half a ton. We, we got better results than the ones we didn't use any zeolite at all. At all. So, well, uh, the, the guy who made the, this uh, scientific investigation with our zeolites was convinced this product not only uh, better the health of the plant, the growth, and many other factors of the earth, because here in Tampico, the earth is full with sodium which makes the, uh, the soil very hard because we live uh, beside the beach. So imagine all the, the salt from the beach getting uh, uh, accumulated or maybe because of the pesticides or whatever, uh, there's a, there's a solid, solid trail, a lot of salt in the soil and the zeolite will bring the soil to balance, an ionic balance. And that's, well, I can explain later, but for me, the zeolite, in a few words, it's a bioregulator. So we will balance out anything. Well, and that's, let's get to the point right now, which is the pyramids. And well, this subject has uh, uh, made me look for information everywhere, but uh, Janik was the first person to teach me to apply it over something that this, uh, this uh, technology or this information, we know there's pyramids everywhere in Mexico, uh, Egypt, and even in Russia and many other places, but uh, how can we use this technology? And Janik was the first one to teach me how to apply it really into matter, into the matter, which is the, the soil, the foods, uh, vegetable plants water and that's like magic that's like alchemy for me and that's transformation and that's moving the energies from the earth and well i will i will try to explain how i understand it in my scientific brain or whatever <laughs> well this is a very a small index about what we we will see and what i exposed to the university of bolivia and this is a small video I made uh, in a presentation maybe some months ago about the pyramid structure and some effects on the plant. Also talked about electroculture. I will put a little bit of the video. It's in Spanish, uh, but I will try uh, to explain a little bit. But uh, it's just introducing uh, electroculture and the pyramids to these guys in the TV here uh, in Tampico. Can you hear it? Okay. I will share again. There we go. Este, bueno, yo me dedico a la nutrición y uh, hace mucho tiempo pues que tengo mucha curiosidad sobre el tema de la agricultura y sobre lo que es eh, eh, la ingeniería de los alimentos y que tiene que ver con las pirámides y todo esto. Bueno, eh, existe una ciencia, una rama de la agricultura que se llama electrocultura, que nace en 1745 y al, a la fecha del día de hoy hay muchos científicos que la están aplicando y es utilizar elementos como lo que vemos aquí, como si fueran antenas, básicamente para canalizar energía terrestre con la atmósfera. Sí, y esto no, lo había, no es algo nuevo, precisamente es algo que las culturas antiguas ya hacían. Eh, solamente que en la electrocultura se utilizan diferentes, este, por así decirlo, equipos. No nada más están las pirámides, hay, hay varillas electromagnéticas, hay obeliscos, hay elementos como el basalto que son para magnéticos y se, se utilizan básicamente para ionizar a las plantas, el agua, 
e inclusive a los seres vivos y en universidades actualmente se aplica eh, la energía de la pirámide para sanar a personas, este, para hacer geoingeniería, geoingeniería es la capacidad de modificar hasta un cierto punto el, el clima, uh -huh. este, con este tipo de, eh, de estructuras, que claro. como, como, por así decirlo, lo más sencillo, pues es como una, como una antena, por uh -huh. así decirlo, ¿no? Muy Entonces, bien. ¿sí? Porque, bueno, algo, algo que queremos dar a conocer es este tipo de tecnologías. Ok, just a little bit because in Spanish and, and I don't want to take a lot of time of it. But uh, this is a, a meeting we made because there's another crazy thing going on around here in Tampico. But uh, we had no hurricanes since 50 years ago. And it's attributed to electroculture. There are some people who planted uh, some uh, uh, type of electroculture. Uh, antenas and it is said and the myth says that these antennas uh, focus with the mental of the uh, the psychic mind of the population make the hurricanes not come here to Tampico and Madero well that's a myth and we're trying to uh, scientifically explain how this works and we have located the people who planted these antennas and Well, it's all connected to a spiritual and UFOs and very strange things. But well, that's just an example of what happens and how I got involved in these uh, antennas things. And well, we have pyramids also here, not only the tower, but we have pyramids here in Tampico and Madero, which it's like very near the beach. And well, the summary of this uh, presentation focuses on the collection and evaluation of data from multiple investigations on the impact of pyramid uh, energy on seed germination. And the pyramidal energy theory suggests that the pyramid structure could intensify and focus free terrestrial energy, positively influencing the biological processes of the plants. We have analyzed study conducted in various environmental conditions with various types of seed focusing in the key parameters such as germination rate and speed, as well as plant growth. All six evaluated studies showed positive results in terms of seed germination under the influence of the pyramid energy, despite of the method method methodological variations It was evidence that the pyramid effect can be beneficial for germination and growth of plants, providing us with more accurate view of the application of the pyramid energy in agriculture. In addition, uh, thermal fingerprints and extremely low frequency readings were recorded at the apex of the pyramid structure. These data offer us relevant information about the interaction of terrestrial magnetic fields within the pyramid and the physical properties of the interest in, of, for plant biology. And well, we have a picture of our teacher here, uh, Jenny Gondor. And well, some keywords uh, I shared, which is electroculture, extremely low frequency, uh, negative ions, hydrogen peroxide, germination, paramagnetism, electrostatic, uh, magnetic fields, Gauss, Schumann resonance, and the word resonance. Well, as a brief in introduction on electroculture, uh, it's a set of ancient agricultural techniques that are based on the use of natural and cosmic energies, such as atmospheric electricity, terrestrial magnetic fields, and cosmic energy frequencies. These techniques, these techniques have endured over the centuries and are still applied today with historical evidence of their use in the ancient civilizations such as Egypt and Babylon. The use of electroculture can bring several benefits to agriculture, such as improving soils, strengthening plant growth, resistant to disease and pests, and improving the nutritional quality of the food. And we have some example of what we can see in the ancient world. We called uh, uh, the... Uh, what's the name of this? Obelisks. And we also find uh, obelisks or megaliths in other uh, civilizations that are made of piezo 
piezoelectric uh, minerals or materials. And well, uh, we know some uh, Egyptians even had uh, some uh, obelisks that have some caps with um, metallic structures. And there's also studies shown that the same pyramids have different chemical um, compositions, and there are some type of zeolite found on, also in the pyramids, uh, which have been used for different properties, but have been used uh, like a coating mostly, not for building the whole structure, but like a silicon oxide, a zeolite type uh, coating for the pyramids. It's not present right now in the pyramids in the present. Well, we have here some images of Jose Carmen, which was uh, one Mexican farmer, which came here to Tamaulipas to prove his seed activation. And actually he was uh, warned from the government here in Tamaulipas in Tampico, not to share his information to the people around here in, in, in the area. Uh, or they will uh, terminate him. And well, he speaks freely about this information on YouTube and he's alive, <laughs> but he has not shared about this, this activation, which I have investigated a little bit about it. And maybe I, I found a little bit about this and it could have uh, some roots in electroculture, but also in some lunar cycles and one book in a specific, uh, which is from our, a man, uh, uh, which I will share later. Well, uh, in the 70s, in Valle de Santiago, Mexico, a well-known example today, uh, Don Jose Carmen has managed to grow cabbages for 40 kilograms without using pesticide or chemical fertilizers. Uh, with his techniques, he also achieved a yield of 107 tons per hectare here in Tampico, Tamaulipas. Uh, greatly exceeding the five tons achieved by the experts from the Ministry of Agriculture in Tampico, Tamaulipas. His technique was based on the activation of seed by cosmic energy and lunar cycles and possibly techniques based on agri and electroculture. We have some images here about uh, some of the plants he grew in the past. And while well, these images mesmerized me, I saw them when I was a child and I grew with these uh, images in my brain of giant plants growing everywhere and, and seeing the food of today, I was, <laughs> I, I don't know, <laughs> once you see this, there's no way to see the world, but differently, I don't know. Look, this, these are lemons or limes or I don't know what the heck. <laughs> That's Miss Don Jose Carmen. Well, what's the objective of electroculture? It is to create a continuous flow of electromagnetic energy generated by the powerful resonance between the terrestrial or telluric electromagnetic grid, the ionosphere, and the cosmic energies, in order to positively influence plant health and optimize various agricultural processes with free environmental resources. According to various studies, such as that the scientist Ramalingam, magnetic fields can regulate various functions of plant, such as health, germination, growth, and improved tolerance to environmental stress. Well, this, this is a study uh, about this scientist that showed that many type of magnetic fields can help in different ways. And he says that 100, and 50 microtesla to 250 microtesla can improve seed germination. All, I think we have a lot more to study because this is just one study. And there's a lot of, there's a mountain of information we can keep studying about this subject, I think. And well, we, we see here an example on, on how the uh, energetic fields work. I think it's just a part of what really goes on on electroculture, but it's a start point to understand how the, the frequencies and the resonance work in the earth and the atmosphere. 
Okay. Uh, Pierre Bertholon and electroculture. Uh, Pierre devoted himself to electrical physics from 1770 and published his findings in the most prestigious scientific journals from 1780 to 1787. He explores he explored the presence of electricity in the human body, plants, atmosphere, and earth, contributing to the recognition of electroculture in Europe. Bertholon applied electricity in medicine, the treatment of diseases, germination, and growth of plants, and he defended the installation of the lightning rods and proposed that earthquakes could result from the accumulation of underground electricity. Uh, I found it very interesting because most, I think, most of the uh, natural disasters are born this way also in the accumulation of some type of energy that needs to be moved. And all these structures that we have uh, now, uh, like the pyramids and all these uh, antennas, can help us move these energies and have a more balanced atmosphere or earth or water or whatever. And here we see some images from the book of Bertholon, which I found interesting. I don't know what's he doing here, but it's like using a wand or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, we have now it's Justin Christoflo. We know a little bit of him, but is known by, by promoting and experimenting in electroculture. He has uh, many, many, many uh, inventions and patents. Uh, he was inspired by Bertholon's works. He became passionate about the application of electroculture in gardening, agriculture, allowing the abundant production of fruits and vegetables without chemical fertilizers. And that's amazing, I think. Christoph Lowe was a prolific inventor, filling numerous patents each year in the field of electroculture, and this laid the foundation for future research. Well, we have uh, his book here. I found his book in Spanish, and I've been sharing it. But, well, uh, I want to share more about Jenik's work in Spanish <laughs> better. So we have, uh, well, his well-known antenna, this is, well, uh, an example I found in the internet of a real one, I don't know. And there's a cabbage measuring 11 feet in circumference. Like, I think you guys in electroculture are, know that this happens like every day or I don't know. <laughs> but for me, it's, it's really new. <laughs> okay, other notable contributions in electroculture we have uh, the known Lakoski coils from George Lakoski invented the electromagnetic energies in their influence, the growth and health of cell organisms. Well, he has some books, I think, not only this one, but he has more. We have also Philip uh, Callahan, which investigated paramagnetism and its relationship to agriculture, developing, measuring devices, and promoting the use of paramagnetic rocks in agriculture. Well, the well-known uh, towers made from the basalt, which I found also amazing. Uh, we have Marcel Violet studied the effects of high frequencies on water treatment and developed a device uh, for treating water with electric shocks, observing profound effects on plant cells. I don't know if this thing is his machine, but <laughs> I think it has something to do with it. Well, the avant grade in electroculture uh, in the 1980s, the research of Martin Perel, PhD, showed that electroculture can increase the growth of medical plants by up to 100%, in addition of increasing the dry weight and active molecular content. Very important because some people think that uh, big vegetables or big plants will not have the same uh, nutritional content, but electroculture, we have more active molecular content. And I think with greater applications and healthier, and I don't know, I think uh, electroculture might give us some, some great results on getting even 
healthier plants with better applications on human health and foods. Uh, we also have our, our teacher, Janet Pondum, PhD, currently leads the cutting edge in the field of electroculture, specializing in effects of sound and electromagnetic waves on water and plant growth. Van Drum participated in writing the book of electroculture, free energies for agriculture, agriculture, and the production of the documentary resonance, the influences of electromagnetic waves and the human beings. Well, I've not seen his basalt book in, his, in English, but once I get it, I'll be glad to, to read it. And well, this is an image of the the study he made about the uh, influence of frequencies sonores <laughs> in the development of the plants, which is in French, but I managed my way to find it in English. Okay. Electroculture in the present. The electroculture has resurfaced today and has captured the attention of various agricultural and ecological movements, such as permaculture, organic agriculture, and sustainable gardening. For its application, certain specific materials and instruments are needed, such as natural minerals, which paramagnetic properties, uh, and simple structures, such as antennas and various metals. Some of the most prominent structures are made are magnetic rods, atmospheric antennas, cylindrical basalt towers, and copper pyramids. Oh, and copper pyramids. <laughs> there we go. Okay, and what's about the pyramids now? Okay, where do the pyramids fit in all this? Uh, the Pyramid of Chaos, we know, one of the seven wonders of the world, characterized by being the height of 148 meters and unique mathematical properties. And it's oriented from north to, north to south, which allows to it to emit electromagnetic fields. This is one image done uh, by a scientist that uh, has shown that uh, the pyramids, uh, the Cheops pyramid, produce these electromagnetic fields. And he has measured the longitude and the distribution of, of the electromagnetic uh, field. And well, we see the field uh, wavelength is from 200 to 600 meters. I think if the pyramid uh, was uh, complete or activated or I don't know, not broken because I think it has some missing parts, it could have more effects on the on the atmosphere on in the earth in the water that has also it has water under the pyramid there is information that the calves pyramid there's a lot of water under it uh, well ancient architecture ancient civilizations use a specific form in their constructions this design exemplified by the pyramids or obelisks could act as resonator, resonators of electrical and paramagnetic energy. Obelisk, the tops of obelisks used to be covered with conductive metals, functioning as ideal antennas for all microwave and electromagnetic radiation. Well, energy in the pyramids have a high a magnetic field density at the top and the increase of electric field voltage of 100 volts slash meter in height. So the highest uh, the pyramid is supposedly, the more voltage you find because it's uh, getting connected to the ionic current. Uh, so if we have, I don't know, a tower, uh, very, a skyscraper might be very high uh, percentage in the voltage at the very top of the skyscraper. So. Uh, we found that the pyramids uh, can be also measured with different uh, technical uh, devices. Uh, I managed my I managed my way to 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 make some of these um, measurements. Sometimes I got lectures. Sometimes I did not got lectures at all. And well, I'll be sharing them at last. 
And the research of Antoine Bobis discovered that the replicas of the pyramids of chaos, Keops can reproduce the mummification of animals, which led to, the mo to more experiments revealing properties for food preservation. Uh, this guy found that uh, some animals got dead inside of the pyramid and they got dehydrated. And well, uh, he found that the food also had a long shelf life put on inside the pyramid. Uh, we find information also about the pyramid in Bosnia, also uh, in the information that uh, our teacher Janik has told us. He's told us about this pyramid in Bosnia, which is the Sun Pyramid. And some scientists also managed to measure the frequencies of the, the this pyramid, which very large, even larger than the Caps Pyramid. And he found uh, variations of the, the kilohertz found in the pyramid, but he found these, uh, these frequencies, very interesting. Uh, there's magnetic, magnetic energy in the pyramids, according to Les Brown. Pyramids collect man, magnetic energy, cosmic ray, rays, and radio waves, releasing it when it reaches a certain mm -hmm. intensity. This energy can have various positive effects on health and other areas. Uh, there are thermal also effects of the pyramids uh, studied by Arif Narin, Narimanov, which is a Russian scientist. He points out that the distribution of the temperatures within the pyramid can influence its functioning. The experiments with Berlises showed that they dried faster and grew more actively within the pyramids. So there are different theories about the uh, energies that the pyramid uh, has inside. And some scientists says that there are magnetic fields, radio waves, uh, that the pyramid has a very interesting uh, thermal uh, functions. There are also uh, scientists that says that the pyramids can also charge in electrostatic energy. So we have different uh, different energies inside the pyramid, not only uh, electromagnetic, but we also find radio waves and whatever else. Uh, uh, there are also some studies done in water, which measured some uh, water alterations and the pyramidal energy can alter pH of the water and promote moisture loss from biological samples, as we see in the food uh, preservation methods. And it is said by this scientist, Arif Narimanov, that the pyramid generates hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. I think uh, this is just a hypothesis of mine, that the pyramid can produce different types of water, depending on where, is, where it is placed and even cycles of the sun or the or the moon this is just one of my hypotheses but this uh, arif narimano uh, investigated that the pyramid produced a uh, hydrogen peroxide and it is also known scientifically proven that the keops pyramid in the king's chamber produced hydrogen highly highly concentrated amount of hydrogen so it might be correct, the perspective of Narimanov. Uh, also, we see an image here about uh, the resonant and microwaves. It's a research shown that the pyramids have internal frequency resonance and microwaves, which can affect water molecules and trigger freeze drying processes. Uh, the freeze drying processes uh, in Spanish, I think, is called leophilization or leophilization. And well, uh, the magnetic field is being measured. And what, we, what is shown here is the water inside the pyramid. This is the magnetic field distribution inside of the, the pyramid. This is the water. Distribution of the magnetic field surface in the water uh, placed inside of the pyramid shape, 300 megahertz. Okay, we see some uh, images here 
of how water looks after being uh, put some hours under the pyramid or even days. This is a very small uh, bubbles start forming. And many, many, many people say that this is a normal when you put uh, the pyramid, the water in the pyramid. And I know, I know, and I've used the uh, high grade hydrogen peroxide and it's, it's actually the same. You see a lot of bubbles in the hydrogen peroxide. Okay, this is some study made on the water. Some, some, some scientists did some studies on the water. And what I find interesting is that uh, water that's being put in the pyramids, its pH tend to be more balanced into seven, not uh, seven plus, but it goes to seven, which is uh, the most balanced pH. It is also found uh, that uh, solid these uh, solids increased in the water increasing the electrical, conduct and electrical conductivity in the water. Uh, I don't know how this is possible, but from not, not finding magnesium in the water, uh, after using the pyramid energy, you could find uh, magnesium in the water, which increased the electrical conductivity in the, in the water, which is pretty strange. I don't know if this is normal, but well, this is a study made by some scientists and had the uh, Amixa laboratory uh, doing its, its analysis for them. Okay, less pyramids. Pyramidal shapes and electrostatic energy. During the 60s, it was evidence that the pyramid shapes can generate electrostatic energy and low frequency magnetic fields. In the recent experiment, it was found that the copper pyramid accumulates a slight charge, mainly when it's aligned in the north, south, west, east direction. Impact of the magnetic field on seeds. Research by Albert Roy Davis and Walter Roll show that the exposure of seeds to specific magnetic fields had a significant impact in their development. Also, the Ebner effect from Guido Ebner uh, show that this effect uh, is based on electrostatic and it promises innovations in genetic engineering, engineering for the total repair of genetical modified plants. So in the first uh, information that is being shown in the year 60s, electric, electric, uh, I'm sorry, uh, low frequency magnetic fields and electrostatic energies are found in the pyramid structures. And these uh, books we find here in the top are related to the topic. I, I don't know if you already know these authors, uh, but it is a link uh, to understanding how we can apply the electrostatic or electromagnetic uh, fields in the seeds or plants. And well, we know that the pyramid, it's a combination of different uh, type of antennas. Uh, that's a very, very known and also teach by our teacher, Janik, that, uh, that the pyramid, it's a compilation of different uh, properties. And we obviously found the mag low frequency magnetic fields and also the, uh, the electrostatic properties. Well, we see a very famous image here from our teacher. I think you already know the information in this image. Some other examples of the pyramids used for uh, small germinations or the basalt, the fam famous basalt being activated with the pyramid shape and maybe water inside that, uh, I don't know what's how to call it. <laughs> And well, some other examples. And well, this is a, a small video about the uh, Ebner effect. Uh, I will share it. By a unique discovery of two scientists of Siba Geigi, now Novartis, in Basel, Switzerland. 
Guido Ebner and Heinz Schürch placed seeds of germ cells of different species into an electrostatic field, a DC voltage field, much like we have it naturally in our atmosphere in a thunderstorm or as it occurs between membrane dipoles in the cell. Only they created fields of an intensity of up to 10,000 volts. The seeds remained in the electrofield for about three days, or sometimes longer, and then were allowed to sprout and grow. The resulting plant or organism displayed a striking phenomenon. Modern-day maize seeds, for example, will develop up to five ears in one place, where normally only one cob develops. This is how maize grew in much earlier evolutionary times. Genetic characteristics that had been lost through cultivation or crossbreeding were brought back and were continued into the following generation of the same plant. The same happened to modern-day wood fern, whose spores were treated in the electrostatic field. It reversed its evolutionary history and grew into a different phenotype of a fern that grew millions of years ago, but no longer today. Chemically and genetically, the wood fern was still the same, but its shape and appearance had jumped back in time. How is that possible? Unless the genetic information is stored somewhere else, possibly in the heliogeomagnetic field, or will at least require a coupling with this background field to access the current version of a plant. The eggs of modern rainbow trout were treated in the same field and surprised the researchers again. The fish, born from the treated spawn, reversed back in time for 150 years to manifest a phenotype of trout that since has become extinct. It has a larger underjaw, different coloring, is much larger in size and displays a much less domesticated behavior than modern farm trout. It also does not need all the antibiotics that farm fish needs to survive. The current paradigm of genetics cannot explain the phenomenon. Is evolutionary history recorded in and perhaps even controlled from a surrounding field? Could we access different stages of development by fine-tuning the electric field treatment? And if the genetic image exists as... Okay, this is a video extract from a video share by Angela in the Electroculture Group. If you're not in that group, uh, I think she, she can share it but it's a uh, very interesting information about uh, the holographic nature of our DNA. And well, that's an interesting subject for later. Well, so we now know that the pyramids uh, uh, investigations say we find all these frequency, these electromagnetic fields, these radiations, but is it safe? or they oppose a risk to human health. Well, that's important because we know nowadays all the magnetic fields and microwaves from, from the cell phone towers and all these uh, apparatus uh, are harmful for plant growth, for bees, for humans, well, practically for everything, even for the water molecules. Uh, and and it's, it's important to uh, share the to the people who who see who are entering the world world of the electroculture that this type of 
antennas are not harmful at all, but all the way around. And it is found that the pyramids is being uh, studied, studied for a long time. Even in the 70s, it has been studied by many Cuban uh, medical practitioners and has been used in human health in the professional practice in Cuba, uh, using it as an analgesic, anti-inflammatory, bacteriostatic, uh, relaxant, and also have some sedation properties. Uh, uh, and, uh, there is also medical research on potential uses that the pyramid can be used to remove a bone cysts. And there's a, some images here about uh, a study done, done on a six year old girl with bone cyst in her arm. And by the six month, well, even by the third month, there's no sign of the bone cyst. And it is said that the pyramid has very good properties on the bone structure and also has also uh, applications to microwave protection from the telephone networks. There's studies done on that on rats. Uh, there's also studies done on rats on tissue generation where they, they use some damaged rats and they put them under a pyramid and others they don't put, it, put them under pyramids and well, the pyramid rats uh, heal faster. They also found that the pyramids uh, have effect on our blood levels of antioxidants. This meaning that the antioxidants in our body will increase if we go inside the pyramid for certain hours. And it's also being investigated on rats with anti-cancer properties. And well, that's very interesting because uh, this type of antennas uh, are very healthy, not only healthy, but very healthy. And that's uh, pretty, pretty safe. Well, uh, I will start uh, reading the data analysis I got from uh, four of the six studies because, well, just for shortening the time, I will talk uh, of four of the six studies, uh, but you can uh, find more information on the paper Angel Angela will provide where I included all the six studies. And well, the first one is the influence of the pyramidal effect on tomato cultivation. The study investigated the effect of black hookaroo woods pyramid on the growth of three tomato cultivars, measuring several parameters every 10 days. All cultivars were found to show improvements on the pyramidal effect, although results varied by cultivator. In addition, the economic analysis revealed gains in the areas with the pyramid effects, with the line two being the most in short the pyramidal effect improved in the yield of tomato cultivars. Okay, this image is just a representation, are not the image of the real tomatoes. But uh, in, in conclusion, the pyramid helped uh, the, the cultivation of the tomato. We also have a, another study. Is the, germ the name is uh, the germination of green gram with influence of the pyramid energy in lunar days, which is interesting because they they took uh, the moon the moon cycles in consideration in this experiment, and they looked at the impact of two types of pyramids, polywood and copper, of two different sizes, and the germination of green grass seeds during the lunar months. The pyramids were observed to improve the germination mean root length and fresh seed weight compared to the control group, although they did not significantly affect baked dry weight. Copper pyramids and larger ones provide to be more effective and germination was greatest during the first half of the crescent moon phase and the second half of the crescent phase. So uh, they got the best, uh, the best uh, germination uh, using the small copper pyramid and the big 
copper pyramid. They also used uh, other material. They got good results, but not uh, as good of, as the copper pyramids, which also our teacher has told us to. Oh, there's another uh, summary of the third study, which is uh, the effect of the pre-sowing incubation with a pyramid on germination and seedling growth. And well, uh, sh this study shows also that the copper pyramid is much better than wooden pyramids. That's the conclusion on this study. And well, she, the, she used uh, uh, she, she made the pyramid also to be facing north, south, and well, she, she used all the correct angles also and well she got great results on the copper pyramids and well the, the fourth and final study in this uh, presentation is also about uh, germination of green grams uh, seeds and it is found that after 72 hours they got the most growth in the pyramid and the pyramid uh, placed uh, seeds with very great results yeah, from the others that they did not use the pyramids. So that's that's where we got it. And well, and the summary and conclusion is the studies on electroculture and pyramidal energy showed positive results in plant growth. Best results are obtained by the copper pyramid with the correct angle measurements and alignment to the north and south poles. This include better seed germination, faster radical growth, and an overall increase in plant growth. Better crop yield was also observed in terms of quantity and quality of fruits under these conditions. The building materials of the pyramids, such as polywood, copper, fiberglass, seem to have influence in, and have effects, uh, possibly due to electrical and magnetic properties. But it does not mean that are the best uh, materials. In addition, maintaining controlled and uniform environmental condition, including temperature, humidity, and lightning, is crucial to the effectiveness of the methods. However, more research is needed to fully understand the mechanisms involved and determine the efficacy of these techniques in different agricultural settings. Beneficial effects were observed with any pyramid building material, but the correct alignment and armor of the pyramid structure is crucial. Using copper is the best. It is recommended to standardize the methodology and construction materials of the pyramids to maximize the reproducibility of their effects and the access to these techniques. And well, uh, for me, it's crucial to establish a criteria to ensure the development of the relevant and reliable studies. This criteria may vary depending on the objective of the research and some examples of these implications are pyramid construction materials, uh, pyramid structure measurements, ground positioning and orientation to magnetic poles, lunar cycles, and maybe tides. Tides also are implicated. Activation of the water or uh, activating the substrates uh, because some studies are, were done using uh, activated water. Uh, and make the, the plants even uh, bigger and faster germination than the only the ones used on the pyramid with no uh, activated water. Uh, that's in the paper. Uh, the presence or absence of light, hours of the exposure of the pyramidal activation, a location of water source or stream under the ground. It's also a study that the pyramid energy can enhance and be enhanced if we have uh, water under the pyramids being uh, naturally moved under the earth. Uh, the height of the geographical position, I think it's also a point uh, that we need to study installation environments, suitable measurement methods for better results. And well, thank you very much. And 
is dedicated, lovely, to our teacher, Jenny Van Durm, and for Angela also. And I have uh, some X-ray images from for my first pyramid, <laughs> my first pyramid, which is not that perfect, but you know the first one might might do the work. It might not. Well, I tried it anyways, and I used some measurements uh, in Les Brown book, and also some uh, uh, advice from Janik and Angela, and I used the uh, I don't know how what what's the name of the of the the copper uh, the copper uh, it's like a copper soldering brass yeah copper soldering is 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 not not brass but is a uh, what's it called the copper uh, silver copper silver yeah it's a copper silver gilding and well this this is the man that helped me and I also had some readings and temperature readings and some infrared light, UV light. I don't know, some studies had this done and I had to had to try them myself. And well, I see the the, the thermic vision shows me that there's a different temperature between the pyramid and the seats inside. And the seats are pretty, pretty fresh in this uh, thermal imaging. And the pyramid is a little bit uh, with a higher temperature. Not much, but a little bit more. I also, well, I charge my seats like four or five days aligned to the top. And this is what's outside. And I had some measurements in the night, maybe at 10 p.m., but just the first three days. After the three days passed, I had no lectures at all. Uh, I had lectures uh, sometimes in, uh, in the day, but uh, I don't know if this has to do with the lunar uh, cycle, uh, but... The days that I had some measurements of the magnetic low magnetic field was on the there was no moon at all. So I don't know if it has has to do. Well, I have some images of my pyramids because because I have more pyramids right now. It's a, we have a copper pyramid, a wood pyramid, a zeolite pyramid. And a UFO pyramid over there. <laughs> and well, I had some readings, very low, low readings in the pyramid this day. It can be shown there in the image, which is 1.3 milligauss, which is really, really, really low frequency. And uh, we have some sproutings going on here. I have a, some a small pyramid also here made, uh, made out of tourmaline, black tourmaline which is said that it's also great for some reason. And well, you can see here, babies growing. And I had some negative uh, ion measurement in the middle with very few ions, but I, I capture very few ions in the, in the pyramid. I also had some lectures with this, uh, this is a, uh, a machine some guy uh, built it in the 80s, which supposedly uh, emit a very small magnetic fields and they used to apply it over water. They used to apply it also uh, for human health in the 80s. And I'm trying to, to see how what it does, what it works. I don't know, I, I'm, I'm trying to see if it has something to do with el electroculture or, or I don't know, but it is made out of copper, uh, some aluminum, uh, some type of engine, um, and also, well, this, uh, which is the crystals, uh, crystal, or normal, I don't know how to call it. When and I have some more bigger lectures from this pyramid, that from the others, but this is connected to the electric grid. So, well, 
So I have my bibliography here and that's all for today about the pyramid investigation I made. And I hope you, you got that interesting. Very interesting, Faustino. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I'm particularly interested in your um, explorations at home with your pyramids. Can what, uh, what? So, what are you? What are you seeing in the use of your pyramids with germination so far? Well, my germination already ended, so I transplanted uh, the seeds to another place. But the the little I don't know where the seeds came. It said that the, they germinated from the eight days, five days. No, I think a little bit more. And they really turned out to be germinating like two days, really, really fast. So the instructions are wrong. <laughs> and well, the seeds are germinated pretty fast. And they're healthy. I, I, I see they are pretty healthy right now, all the seeds. And I I will install uh, the atmospheric antenna, and uh, to see if it helps in some in some area. And uh, what I'm also trying to do with the, the pyramid is trying to perfect its its angles because its angles are not that sharp; they are a little bit mm, I don't know rounded, and I think that is important. Uh, because well, our teacher has told us it, it has to have the best angles, and well, that's are some aspects I need to I need to keep experimenting, and well, uh, I I think I will have other other results, and I'll be share I'll be sharing also. That's great. Also, okay, so we have some questions. Be, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, so uh, Brenda here is asking by direct message. Brenda, uh, uh, to the group, if you want Faustino to see it, you mentioned to charge them for a few days. Can you re recommend what the minimum time is to see a difference in earlier germination? Okay, what I found before applying uh, the pyramid energy, what I found, I don't know if this is correct, but uh, this is some information I found is that you need to place first the pyramid 15 hours uh, to get, I don't know, in connection with the electromagnetic field of the grid or the earth, and then uh, put the seeds. Uh, I don't know if this is correct, but I think it's like uh, helping the structure getting connected to the earth or, or to the place is going to be working. So I left it there first 15 hours. Afterwards, I put the seeds, uh, I put a box and then I put the seeds so they are like in one third of the pyramid. They're not uh, really in the in the <coughs> ground. So I left them there uh, four to five days. Uh, I've heard from the last uh, class about pyramids. Their teacher Janik said that three days is okay. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not sure if he said that, but uh, I used a little bit more days. I found some information about overexposure on the pyramids that I need to keep an eye on, and it's interesting because uh, I don't know if it uh, applies to seeds or to humans. But here in Tampico, long time ago, many people used pyramids. I don't know from where they got the information, but they used wood pyramids for health reasons. If the light went out, they put the pyramids, the food inside the pyramids and all this stuff. And one of our uh, family uh, uh, told us that one of his friends used a very big a wood pyramid. And very interesting because I think uh, that our teacher Janik has told us about people believing or not believing in the pyramid. It's important because it can enhance its believing uh, uh, properties on you. I don't know. 
but uh, this guy has had this pyramid and his wife didn't didn't want the pyramid didn't want to know about the pyramid at all and one day she accepted getting in the pyramid a wooden pyramid and it went wrong after she was one hour sleeping inside the pyramid she woke up and she could not speak at all <laughs> She was like numbed down of the mouth or something. And that made her paranoid or something and disliked more the pyramids. So maybe maybe we need to get in the inside the pyramid when we are calmed down, we're not thinking negative things. We are not trying to, I don't know, think bad about somebody else, but because it's antenna, it's an antenna. So it might resonate with you in that moment. And well, for me, I have not any bad experience with my copper pyramid. I've been using it on myself and I'm okay. I have not, I'm not lost my speech, but uh, she was afraid about what happened to her. And well, that's, that's interesting. Yes, amplifies intentions is how Yannick phrased it. It amplifies our intentions. So we do have to be conscious of our intentions when we enter in. Kim, you had your hand up. All right. Um, have you noticed, Faustino, a difference in effect between like a basic, one of the, those skeletal pyramids, right? The basic ones with the cap. I saw some of those photos that had like a cap on it um, versus ones without a cap versus a solid pyramid versus a hollow pyramid. Have you seen any difference in effects between all of those? Yeah, most that feeling the effect because I need to I need to make some more experiments. This this is really my first experiment. Uh, but what I found in the investigations is that the thing that you put inside the pyramid it needs to have contact with the air around it. So the air around it is an important factor for it getting uh, energized or microwave or I don't know, but remember, let's remember that uh, our cells and atoms really are not uh, a, a space that is filled with uh, the atoms. It's not solid at all. I don't know if I, I am getting understood, but uh, there's a space between our atoms and there's air in between that space. So air is important uh, for it has the, the resonance effect we were searching. That's why I what understand. So the cavitation inside the towers, the cavitation in, in other structures like cathedrals or even our instruments need to have some type of air to produce the sound, which is a frequency. So it's important, I think, for it to have a space for air to flow. So uh, a very, very um, closed uh, pyramid, it might have an effect, but I think it's much better there's a flow inside of air. I wonder if that's why the, um, uh, um, the round towers um, the big ones that they put up in Ireland and um, I forgot what that other video was, um, um, but they had those up and they had like windows in them. I wonder if that was I for think airflow that, maybe, um, uh, I think know, apart some from other problem. things. Mm -hmm. Some are harmonics going on there, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Tammy is interested in hearing any tips that you have about making pyramid fabrication easier. <laughs> I, I don't know. It was really hard for me. <laughs> I call the pyramid that I have the pyramid that almost ended my marriage. <laughs> my husband said, no more. I'm making no more pyramids. No, well, it's that's what I was asking because I don't want to end my marriage. <laughs> no, I'm just joking, of course. But yeah, it is very, very challenging because... It's a complex relationship of angles, right? The top angles have to meet just so in order that your tubes can fit in and, you know, uh, land properly at, at the base um, junctures. 
Uh, Faustina, what was like, how, what was that like for you? I saw that you were working with a fabricator. What was that like to fabricate a pyramid with someone else? Okay, before uh, making the copper pyramid, I made the wooden pyramid. So I based uh, the angles on the wooden pyramid, which was perfectly made by also some guy that helped me. <laughs> but uh, we tried the best to get the angles pretty straight on this wooden pyramid. Uh, I think, uh, no, no, I don't think the copper pyramid was even uh, bigger than the, than the wooden pyramid. So it means that it has not the, the, the angles I'm searching, but even though, uh, even though I have these issues, I found strange things happening in my pyramid, like spiders growing their nests and strange things that, that I have never even uh, seen in my own room happen. So, well, uh, I think it has some power, and I measured some magnetic field, but I think if we sh we sharpen the edges, we can cut more in the edges of the electromagnetic fields. I can definitely um, contribute a couple of testimonials about the pyramids so far, because we fabricate, my husband has fabricated and my son together have fabricated a couple of pyramids, a small one that is over a cabbage and another plant in comparison to others. So we have controls and we have a couple under the pyramids and there's no question that they're growing at least twice as large right now. And we're only about eight weeks um, into the growing season. Um, also, we have a, a small, a very small pyramid inside a parsley bed and very clearly the parsley around the pyramid is growing lusher. There are more branches in, 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 in individual parsley plants and it's greener. And I would love so, so much for, uh, to have the opportunity to actually send in, uh, you know, samples to have analyzed for um, things like, um, uh, you know, essential oil properties, uh, dry weight properties, um, you know, to actually measure these things because we have so few studies. Uh, you, you showed one of those studies in your presentation and then Yannick has one in one of his, um, in one of his um, uh, presentations on a parsley field as well. It would be so interesting to see if we could actually, you know, put some kind of quantitative data behind what we, behind this qualitative, um, these qualitative examples. And the third example I have is um, uh, the large scale pyramid that we have. We, we now call it the defragger because we sit inside the pyramid and we feel like it defrags. You know how we did our computers in the 2000s? It defrag, we feel like it defrags our mind. And my husband, who's a skeptic, um, sits under it and he says it clarifies his thoughts. And there's a woman who comes here weekly, uh, who works here during our homestead days, who says that it's helping her knee. She's had a bum knee for a decade or more. So, you know, and she too, like, would not just jump into accolades about something that she didn't feel uh, was showing results. So, uh, I, you know, we have to keep going because one season is not enough. Right, Yannick has 15 years behind uh, his experience with these things, maybe not pyramids, but electroculture in general. And as we do more and more of these experiments, we can start to put together our experiences, right? Make links between my experience and yours, for example, and then uh, you know make more pointed experiments. So I'm definitely an advocate of pyramids, but I, I, I don't suggest, unless you know a fabricator or you are a fabricator, this is not something to mess around with. I genuinely suggest you either align yourself with a fabricator or you buy Yannick's kit and just get it done. Because in the end, what we discovered was that it was not less expensive either to fabricate your own pyramid. It is not an inexpensive process because you cannot do this with a simple torch setup, right? as you know, as I'm sure you learned with your fabricator. It's true, it's true. Um, I'm assuming that you're mostly talking about the pyramids that are made out of pipes, right? Because these are probably more challenging because like the regular wire or thicker or, yeah, that there's also the size of the pyramid, but beside the point the like wire ones would be much easier to start with, right? 
Well, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, copper requires, uh, you know, a, a brazier or a, a, a torch that burns at a higher temperature. Someone correct me. It, uh, Anna knows a lot about this also. So you, it's not, um, it's not like a simple process. If you're, for example, a plumber and you are um, just melting, um, you know, uh, materials to join copper pipes, that's not the case. Okay. It's not that simple. So you will need uh, you will need some special um, uh, equipment to do this, and some special skill, as far as I'm concerned, because as I watched it unfolding, holding things in place as you're trying to create the 51 degrees and the so on, like you know, it's enough to drive a person bananas. And mm -hmm. if if the pyramid is not in its proper shape, it will not yield results. This I know also because there are some that broke. And I tried to wind them with wire, for example. And, uh, you know, they simply did not produce results. So, okay. uh, yeah. I'm, I'm and about the, yeah, sorry, about the soldering again, you guys said this is like copper, silver. Does that mean that the soldering itself is a mix of copper and silver? Or is it just the silver that you have to get to, like silver soldering? that you use on the copper or, or does the soldering already is a mix? The soldering is already a mix. They're copper okay. rods that you purchase and usually they have like a very, very small percentage of uh, an additive material that makes them really technically, I guess, an alloy. It's uh, copper with usually it's uh, silver. Sometimes it can be tin, uh, but it's like very small amounts I can't, I can't say exactly why that is. I think it's because copper alone is too brittle. I believe that's what I understand. But someone please jump in if you, um, if you understand this better. Yeah, I have one more question about, um, you were showing some plants that kind of reverted to the original forms. Kind of fascinating is, does that mean that we might be able to kind of breed out the GMO garbage out of any possible cultivation? Yes, yes. Uh, the Ebner effect is uh, some electrostatic fields applied to the seeds and afterwards the seeds uh, evolve or devolve or I don't know how to call it, go back to their roots, to their primitive genetic uh, print and it's fascinating it is found that also in some animals uh, this application works uh, which make them more primitive looking like or not all all modi or modified or whatever and well it is known uh, right now that electromagnetic fields in cell phones are dna damaging so there's also the other way around. There's also some magnetic field that can repair DNA. So it is uh, important to search about the Ebner effect, which you can reproduce. And I think there are some papers on how to build this, uh, uh, this uh, magnetic uh, Ebner effect uh, machine or something. I think there's information about that. Yeah, that gives us hope, right? <laughs> we can fix this yeah. stuff. Also, I think you can take a look on the ClO2, which is the chlorine dioxide, or the zeolite. The zeolite also generates uh, electrostatic fields on its edges, on the structure edges, which also, there's also studies on the zeolite being used to purify DNA samples and to modulate genetic expressions uh, in a good way. So it meaning, it meaning that it will optimize your DNA, ex your good DNA expressions, uh, zeolites in this uh, information. So how does chlorine dioxide then work? Uh... Chlorine dioxide can work removing pesticides and also increasing oxygen or electric voltage on the cells. We know that when we increase electric voltage in the cells, it will give more life to the cell. For example, it will mm -hmm. protect from bacteria, virus, 
and in this uh, and in this case uh, uh, strange dna material or i don't know gmos not only can be fabricated with the conventional methods but it is known that they want to use uh, this uh, RNA uh, technology in the plants also. So I think uh, this, uh, these substances, which is the ClO2, carbon dioxide, and zeolite can help uh, benefit this, uh, this thing and also the Ebner effects or general, all the electroculture, uh, all the electroculture has uh, benefits on the DNA of all the plants. So I think they can get protected, no problem. That makes sense. About the zeolite, uh, I mostly know it from like, you know, cleanses for the as a binder. But you also said you could use it on the um, on the loan. But if you if you like dig it into the soil, I was wondering, and it binds to the bad stuff, wouldn't you have to get rid of it? Like, you know, your body, when you do the cleanse, eventually gets rid of it, right? Whatever metal are bound to it, etc. Mm -hmm. How, because if you don't get rid of it from the soil, then it would still be, be in there. Yes. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the unhealthy metals and stuff. Yes, the zeolite will capture these heavy metals but won't leach out. So it's a, a super cage that won't leach out the metals. And for example, okay. if I have contaminated zeolite uh, for some reason and I eat it or I drink it, the zeolite won't give me those uh, contaminants it absorbed before. Uh, the zeolite is pretty um, balanced on its properties. And once it gets a heavy metal, it won't it won't go away, unless you put it under a great stress, like a volcanic heat or something on of that nature. But zeolite, once it gets a heavy metal, it won't leach it out. So, well, if you have a plant uh, under the soil and the zeolite grabs the heavy metal, it won't leach it in the plant or the soil. So, mm -hmm. yes, it will be in the zeolite. Well, but won't get a leach into the, uh, I don't know, to the, the plants or, or whatever. Okay. All right, question. thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question regarding the chlorine dioxide? Do you spray it on the plants? Yeah. Like, it, it, it looks like you said uh, 10 mils in one liter. Yeah, you could spray it. Let's no spray it, problem. okay. Actually, uh, I had some fungus formation in some plants and I used the chlorine dioxide and in half an hour, they were gone. Uh, I had I have permits for the ClO2 as an antioxidant for fruits. So if you have, I don't know, almost rotten tomatoes or strawberries or whatever, you can put the ClO2 and you can see how it comes back again to life. And it helps the structure, it helps the flavor, and it helps also uh, killing bacteria, fungus, or whatever it could uh, find. Parasite also can kill it all the way. And also the chlorine dioxide you could uh, use on a spray in, in, your, in your plants or you could uh, use, um, I don't know, like all, other type of uh, other type of method, but uh, you could use it no problem in any concentration, actually. I've seen people using high concentration of chlorine dioxide on plants, and they are pretty good, but I suggest you, uh, you use the, uh, a little bit not that concentrated for mm -hmm. first uh, applications. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Faustino, um, to piggyback off of that, how how much would the one liter cover? Like how much space? Like are we really putting it on or kind of lightly all around? 
Okay, uh, I'm not sure how to answer because uh, for my case with the front yard, all the chemicals. You could use it uh, until it until you finish the litter. Uh, I don't know. You can you can try it out. You can try it out and see how it fits. But I don't see any problem uh, over over using chlorine dioxide in your plants. Uh, uh -huh. Try not to overflow your your plants in that case, but if you mm -hmm. have uh, I, I don't know parasites, fungus, or whatever, or even if you want to give a boost uh, of the mitochondrial oxygen to the plants, you could do it two or three times a day. Uh, the chlorine dioxide works in a frame of one hour, so if you use it. Uh, the chlorine dioxide it will have an effect one hour, and you could use it again, and until that hour passes by. So, for example, in humans, if we have some uh, injury, some type of burns in our skin, or uh, if I cut myself with um, I don't know, doing my gardening or whatever. I can spray also chlorine dioxide, uh, one in in a one milliliter. Uh, I'm sorry, ten milliliters in one milliliter of water, and I can spray it uh, once uh, every hour until well, I, I I get my well. Chlorine dioxide can help uh, your blood not to. Uh, it has hemostatic properties that will help you to get uh, to heal faster and will protect you from bacteria or for fungus and not getting your wounds infected, for example. So uh, the application is one hour if you have uh, or your plants has some type of disease, for example. Mm -hmm. what and, um, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, what concentration are you are you talking about? Yeah, oh, I'm talking about uh, putting 10 milliliters of chlorine dioxide in one liter of water. Okay, thank you. Sure. sure. It was a great talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Anna. Did Anna want to say something? No. Okay. Um, Oh, I hear an echo. Yeah, that's me. I'm sorry. Anna, go ahead. Um, me? Yeah. Okay, so I had to go on my phone because the computer wasn't working. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, uh, Faustino, I, I wonder, um, going back to the... Um, uh, the uh, rewriting of the cells with the uh, static electric field. And I'm wondering and um, how you feel about this, but we're in a holographic universe here and everything yeah. is holographic. And then um, I'm wondering if that static field isn't picking up a piece of the original DNA um, coding or whatever and rewriting the, uh, the seeds to uh, to the original print. I'm, I'm not sure how else to explain it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think I got it. Uh, I think there are different uh, um, ways of imprinting the electrostatic, the correct electrostatic field because there are also uh, Damaging electrostatic fields also in information found. Uh, I I will make sure Angela uh, shares with you the video uh, about that holographic uh, nature of the DNA, which shows that if we use it wrongly or in a, mm, not a correct way, this electrostatic uh, fields can not only damage our DNA, but can mutate them in a very strange way, <laughs> but very strange way. So I guess we 
we need to focus more on this uh, Ebner Ebner effect and start from there, because there are they, I think there are electrostatic fields which are not also that healthy, and the Ebner effect is like the basis uh, to understanding this uh, genetic modification with electrostatic fields. So let's start from them, from that place. Yeah. Be interesting. We all wake up as Neanderthals. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's an improvement. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe. I have better hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it really it does provide a, a great deal of promise, which um, you know Olga today in our earlier talk reminded me of that. Uh, you know, it, it, if this is true, then really there is no extinction. It's no such thing as extinct. And we are devolving. <laughs> yeah, and, and we can consistently, constantly pull from the field. Information can be pulled from the field at any time, which we also heard in today's presentation on um, uh, seven star beekeeping, that the information that was received about seven star beekeeping had become itself extinct and was derived from intuition or re-derived, remembered, you know, we talk about this a lot, remember mm -hmm. information mm -hmm. remembered from the field. So this is, uh, you know, it's very hopeful. It's very hopeful to me. Well, well, I know for a fact that, I mean, um, the walls or the structure that you're living in um, remembers all the conversations and all of the, uh, the things. So there, there is a, like, you know, a location memory which is why, you know, psychics would go into Auschwitz or whatever, and they would, um, they would have the uh, information of what truly went on there and such. So it's all very, very interesting. And I love that it's all coming out. But, um, yeah. What's interesting is that this, the speed that it's coming out at the moment, right? The, the momentum of this information and, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's wild to me to see that uh, a year ago, there were so, so few of us even investigating these kinds of things. And now there are so many of us that are taking action and building and seeing results. So, you know, this is unstoppable and that's just really beautiful. Uh, for those of you who dare, for those of you who dare, I have put, uh, Laszlo has shared the specs um, created by the designer that uh, created the jigs that then led to the creation of the pieces that then needed to be put together by a fabricator that then <laughs> came together to be a pyramid. Okay, so like you're four steps away, but there you have it in the comments section. Okay, so if you dare, <laughs> Go to it and have a good time. Um, okay, so don't say I didn't warn you. That's all I want to say. <laughs> could could I just like ask? A 3D printing file though. Those are design like. Yes, right. yes. Someone needs to create that 3D printing file. There's like I'm telling you, there are a lot of steps here, right? But could somebody download that for me because I can't on my phone. I, did. I took care of it. Thank you very much, Tammy. Yeah. Okay. Um, I posted a question there. If there's any further documentation about CD and plants, I'd be interested in reading up on that more. I don't know if there's yeah. a book about it or a PDF or anything. I will search for it, but uh, there's there's a lot of groups on Telegram about uh, information about CDS, which is a very big growing community right now. It's getting bigger each time here in, in Mexico, Latin America, and other speaking Spanish audiences. It's pretty big. Uh, we, we are having a hard time entering into the English uh, language, but we have uh, many people involved in the English community, and I can uh, share information and the right persons to find more information in general about uh, chlorine dioxide and applications, not only in plants, but also in our animals and our foods or ourselves. And I yeah, I've heard a lot about it from a health, like our health perspective, but I haven't heard a lot about 
soil remediation and treating plants with it and such. So that'll be interesting. Great. Yeah. Faustino, thank you so much for sharing this presentation with us in English. This is great. So folks, if you go back into the group, you can read Faustino's paper. It's been translated into English um, on the use of pyramids as uh, he discussed today in his presentation. Um, a, a final question from Kim here. How long after weed killer is applied to lawn should the zeolite remediation begin? Okay. Um, I think the zeolite uh, can be used before or after right away. No problem. So what, what I find interesting about this, the zeolite is that it will have an effect in not only in the plant, but also on the ground bacteria and the mineral contents in the earth. And one thing that it will provide the earth, which is lacking, is the silicon oxide. The silicon oxide is a mineral that will uh, create tissue, meaning bone, meaning hair, meaning uh, our all the tissues of our of our body, and also create a tissue for plants, which are uh, silicon oxide. Is it is uh, related even to our uh, lifespan. And it is, there are studies shown that people who has less uh, silicon dioxide in their, in their body in total uh, tend to have a la less life span. So I think it's like uh, getting our minerals correct in our body and getting high vibration. And we are tuning ourselves with the earth uh, consuming the zeolite and using it on the earth. So I think uh, if you use the zeolite, not only the, for the application after intoxicating a medium of ourselves, but using the zeolite before we get intoxicated is the best way. For example, some people use the zeolite when they feel intoxicated or they feel symptoms or something but I prefer to use the zeolite before each meal because it will clean our food, it will kill, clean our gut, and it will clean our blood, and it will prevent pesticides or substances to entering our body. So uh, the other way around is people eating and drinking, getting intoxicated, and then using the zeolite, which is not the way. I think if we use the zeolite since before this happens, we'll get the better results and it goes uh, for the earth also. Okay, because the, the weed killer was applied <laughs> for people who didn't join um, before Angela recorded, someone in my household who shall remain nameless applied some weed killer to the entire front yard. And I was looking out the window as he was applying it and I was just freaking out. And so, so that's why Faustino is helping um, with this uh, subject, how to detox the, uh, the grass, the dirt, the soil, everything. Um, so yeah, we got that going on. And um, um, so you mentioned spraying the chlorine dioxide solution yeah, once every great. hour. Okay, can, for, for how long? It. Um, maybe you could do it uh, from one to one day for detoxing and then try using some uh, applications three times per day, for example. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Chlorine dioxide is not as stable as the zeolite. Zeolite can, I don't know, it exists from long time ago and its structure is like very strong but chlorine dioxide destroys this molecule with UV light. So it will be gone really fast. So it won't so get then, So I should do zeolite. Something. So I should do zeolite instead. So you could try both. You could try both. Uh, in human health, we try both. We use both because oh. they 
enhance themselves, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yes, you know, how can we reach you if we want to know more from you, if we want to connect with you? How can we find you? Yeah, I, I've got a Telegram channel, but I have no personal information there. But I can put my uh, my email here. Let me write it down. Okay, Anna, we'll continue on after we um, after we close and we can we can carry on. If you, anyone uh, watching the replay wishes to contact Faustino, it is Cortez Faustino 33 at Gmail. That's Cortez C O R T E S Faustino F A U S T I N O 33 at gmail.com. Faustino, thanks again for spending time with us today and sharing everything that you've learned. Uh, you're, you've clearly got a bright future ahead of you, and we're so excited to see it unfold. Thanks for thanks thank for you. being here. Thank you very much, and thank yeah. you for all being here. Thanks, Faustino. Thank you.